All right. So this is the slide we ended up with. And if you weren't here on Friday, this will be double dutch to you. Right? Maybe. Oh, we got a test on Friday. Do we have a test on Friday? Yes. We have a no, test on Friday. Wednesday next week. I am going to move it for Wednesday next week. <laughs> you are? Seriously? Yeah. So I'm going to move the test to Wednesday next week. And <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> so test Wednesday next week, and it's because I had to bump the first test today, so we're going to bump the test to Wednesday next week, okay? I will send you a take-home part of your exam. You good? Take home part of your exam by uh, midnight on Friday, okay? So, and that will be due Seriously, in class. That will be due in class on Wednesday within the first two minutes of class on a Scantron, okay? All right, let's move on with the content. So, this we've already covered, okay? My movies, the SWS just won't work. <laughs> so terms, I think I've given you these terms. Osmotic concentration, have I given you that term? Osmotic concentration. Osmotic concentration refers to the concentration of the solution that will impact osmosis. So it's concentration of solution that will impact osmosis. Okay. Osmotic pressure, I think I did define that for you last time. Osmotic pressure, remember, is the pressure exerted by osmosis. And it particularly refers to the pressure exerted against the cell membrane or the cell wall as a result of osmosis. Say that, part, that last part one more time. It's the, the pressure exerted against the cell membrane or the cell wall as a result of osmosis. That's what it means when you talk about it in a cellular context. And you were talking about the example you gave was the saline solution and the water bursting the cells. No, that I gave you as an example of why when you irrigate a wound or a membrane with just water, it kind of stings a little bit, okay? We explained that. If I go back to this slide, <coughs> osmotic pressure is what results in these level differences, okay? There has to be a force which causes this level to be different to this level. Go. Okay. Reverse osmosis, not talked about that one. Now, how many of you have an RO system, reverse osmosis system at home? Or you've seen those big units outside grocery stores, right? That you know you put in your 25 cents gives you a gallon of RO water. Well, reverse osmosis is the process that they use to get relatively pure, and what I mean by pure is solute-free water from regular tap water. So tap water in the city of Mesa is, is diabolical, really. It's very, very, very high solute concentration. It's one reason why it doesn't taste good. And so you can remove those solutes in a number of different ways, and one way is by reverse osmosis. Now that you understand osmosis, right, you should if you thought hard, maybe you could come up with a mechanism of how reverse osmosis works. So I'll draw that YouTube. And I want you to maybe come up with some ideas as to how reverse osmosis could work. Here's our selectively permeable membrane. And this selectively permeable membrane, let's say it only allows water to pass through it, only, nothing else. And here we have good old Mesa City tap water, which is really loaded with solutes. You know that lime scale you find around your faucet or in a kettle? That's the solutes left behind after the water evaporates. It's very high in solutes, very hard water. 
So I'll draw those in green. Right? The green dots sort of indicate the solutes. Now what we want to do, if this is Mesa City tap water going in, what we ideally want is a solution on that side, basically water, either devoid of solutes or with very, 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 very few. Okay? So, after reverse osmosis, that might be our solute concentration. If this was our situation, in which way would water move by osmosis? Would water diffuse by osmosis? It would diffuse in that direction, right? But reverse osmosis goes in the reverse direction than what the water would go by diffusion, right? How do we do it? How could we do it? What would you have to do to this system to do it? Pressure. Pressure where? On the left side here? No. On this side? Yes, because only water can What kind of pressure and where? Sorry? Going down. Like pressure pushing down here? Yeah? How much pressure? Now, if you're looking for like, what do I want? A pressure in pascals, pounds per square inch? I don't know. No, I'm not looking for that. How much pressure though? Think. Think relative pressure. How much relative pressure? Not absolute, but relative to what? It has to be stronger than the osmotic pressure. Yes, bingo. Good answer. All right. If there's an osmotic pressure in this direction, the pressure you exert down here has to exceed the osmotic pressure, right? And if it exceeds the osmotic pressure, that's going to actually push water molecules this way against the direction they would diffuse. Solutes can't move. So what, we get a plunger? Sit on the plunger, is that enough? Make your own RO water at home, sitting on the plunger? The actual pressure in the home systems is city water pressure. When you turn the faucet on, there's a pressure, right? Yeah? Of the water coming out of the faucet. Well, it's just that pressure that pushes the water this side and you get relatively pure, and when I say pure, I mean low solute concentration water. That's how reverse osmosis works. Can I refer to as parts per million? Yeah, you can refer to the number of solutes as parts per million, sure. Okay, so that's reverse osmosis. And if you have a reverse osmosis system at home, you actually have one of your little cylinders with a membrane in. Semi-permeable membrane. Okay? It's not a filter, no. There are filters like charcoal and other bits and pieces, sediment filters. It's actually a membrane. Okay? All right, so the greater the concentration of the solute, the greater the... Pressure. What kind of pressure? Osmotic pressure, right. If I increase this solute concentration, then the osmotic pressure will also increase. All right, so now I've got another little problem for you to apply what you've learned. Let's take a, an animal cell say a red blood cell, all right? It's my best drawing of a red blood cell. They sort of have this biconcave shape. So let's just say we put a red blood cell in a solution that is um, isotonic to the red blood cell. Isotonic to the red blood cell. What's going to happen to the red blood cell? Where is water going to move? Good, in and out, about the same in as what moves out. All right, so the red blood cell, what's going to happen to its size, shape, volume? Right, probably nothing, it's going to say the same. So let's just say now I dunked my red blood cell in a solution that is hypertonic. What's going to happen? Sorry? Water will leave the cell, right? Hypertonic, more concentrated outside. Water will leave the cell by osmosis. So what's going to happen to the cell then? Shrink, shrivel up. Yep. Until what? No Until tell they're isotonic. Okay. 
So we put our red blood cell in a solution that is hypotonic. What happens? Hyper. Hypo. I said hyper. So hyper is when it, water leaves the cell? Hyper, more concentrated, water will leave the cell. Hypotonic. What happened? And what happened? Burst. Right, it does. Burst. So I was talking to someone who took 181 from me about three or four years ago the other day, and she said, I don't need to know any of that stuff. Right? She said, you know, we, I talk to nurses, and they say you don't know any of that stuff. Don't need to know any of that stuff. And you kind of do and you kind of don't, to be honest. All right? Some of the details you may not need to know, but the concepts you, you need to know. So this would explain, though, why when you hook someone up to an IV, you would never give them deionized water, just water to rehydrate them, right? The minute that water goes into their veins, you're going to start probably bursting red blood cells. Not going not to work. You might think, let's give them pure water, let's get them hydrated. No, you give them a, salt con a, salt con a, you give them a solution that has a, an ion concentration, usually sodium chloride, all right? Because you don't want to burst all their cells the minute that solution goes into their blood, all right? Okay, so, good. That's what would happen with animal cells. If we put them in a solution which was hypotonic, they'd burst, or lies. Isotonic, they'll remain normal. And if we put them in a hypertonic solution, then they'll shrink or shrivel. And so here's the little graphic that's in your book, or they've replaced it with one that looks like a red blood cell. Okay? So what happens to animal cells then? So how many of you are saying, aha, but what about amoeba that are in pure water? They don't burst, right? Animal-like protists, they're not bursting, but we can put them in pure water and they seem to do okay. How does that work? <coughs> Sorry? Well, amoeba don't, remember. Some protists do, amoeba don't. So what's the gig with amoeba? How can they not burst? They can... Well, their actual, their cytoplasm is more concentrated than the solution that they're in. Okay? Well, amoeba don't have cilia. So if the cell cytoplasm is more concentrated than the solution they're in, they must uptake water by osmosis, right? How do they deal with it? They don't swell up and burst. Sorry? It does go both ways, but it goes in more than it comes out. At least by osmosis is a clue for you. Say you're in a boat. boat's got a hole in it. Water's coming into the boat, right? It's a bit like water coming into the amoeba. If you don't do anything, what happens? Sink. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? All right, say so you can't plug the hole. You're going to bail it out, right? That's what the amoeba do. They bail out the water. They're able to actually take the water from their cytoplasm, concentrate into something called a contractile vacuole, and then release it in the vacuole. So they concentrate all the water in this little vacuole, and the vacuole expels the water to the outside. And it happens quickly all the time. Paramecium do it as well. You can actually see under the microscope this vacuole filling and emptying, filling and emptying, filling and emptying. Okay. All right. So animal cells then. Uh, sorry, plant cells. They're a bit different to animal cells. What happens if we put a plant cell in a solution which is hypertonic. Plant cell in is hypertonic. Where's the water going to go? It's going to leave the cell by osmosis. So what's going to happen to You've seen this. We did this in the lab, right, with the onion root, onion cells. Put them in a salt solution. What happens to them? They shrink up inside. The cell wall doesn't change, does it? But the part of the cell inside the membrane does. And when a cell, well, I'll show you the graphic. So it shrinks. Oh, 
What happens when we put them in a isotonic solution? <coughs> Do you think there's a pressure against the cell wall? Does the cell exert a pressure against the cell wall if we put them in an isotonic solution? No, there is no pressure. All right? No osmotic pressure because there's no difference. If we put them in a hypotonic solution, what happens to the plant cells? Absorb water, swell, they increase in volume. They don't burst because the cell wall. All right, so here are some of the terms then. When we put them in a hypotonic solution, they become turgid. And for a plant cell, that's their normal condition. Okay? They exert an osmotic pressure against the cell wall. And so if you've just been bought flowers, the flowers are nice and upright, you know, they're not wilting. If you put them in an isotonic solution, there's no pressure against the cell wall, and they're going to be what's flaccid, and the plants might actually wilt a little bit. So now every time you got you bought flowers, which I'm sure happens a lot, right? Guys are either buying flowers for someone or ladies getting them. When they're wilting, think about that. Oh, they must be in an isotonic situation, right? I better make sure I put them in what kind of solution? Hypotonic. Hypotonic, because I want my cells to be turgid. So that way my flowers are sticking up, right? And if they lose water, and you saw that, the membrane sort of shrinking away from the cell wall, they become plasmalized, it's called. Plasmalized. And that's bad news for a plant. They can recover a little bit, but not too much. So, and here's the graphic showing. All right. Turgid, normal, water goes in. Isotonic, same water goes in as out. Hypertonic, they become plasmalized. Plant's going to wilt. Oh, no. I want to show you these two movies. Okay, so have a look at this little quick time movie, and it's of Elodia. I want you to tell me what kind of solution do you think these plant cells are in? Just have a look at the movie. What kind of solution? Explain what's going on. Hypertonic. They're in a hypertonic solution. Explain what's going on. What, what would you call that? They're becoming plasmalized, right. So try to get used to using the technical terms. All right, they're becoming plasmalized. Hypertonic solution, yeah. All right, let's have a look at this one. What, firstly, what's, what's causing those chloroplasts to shoot around? Which part, which cellular component is doing it? Part of the cytoskeleton, which part? Should I tell you? Maybe I won't. What kind of solution are these cells in? It's not microtubules. They're turgid, right? They're turgid, so they're in a hypotonic solution. If they were in an isotonic solution, I would imagine you wouldn't see any cytoplasmic streaming, okay? Is it the microtubules? No, it's not microtubules. You've got a 33% chance, right? Guessing right. Now you've got a 50% chance.
Okay, so so far then, we focused on osmosis, we focused on the movement of water, we focused on diffusion. Now, so far then, we po focused on diffusion, which is passive transport. Passive transport, remember, requires no energy. Now we're going to look at facilitated diffusion, which is also a form of passive transport, requires no energy. But facilitated diffusion is diffusion that is facilitated by or assisted by a protein or some kind of, let's just say protein, a protein. Okay, it's assisted by a protein. Now, in fact, the movement of water into and out of cells is facilitated diffusion. The movement of water by osmosis into and out of cells is facilitated diffusion. Don't require any energy, it's just diffusion, but you need the assistance of a protein molecule, a mem an integral membrane protein. Okay? An, an integral membrane protein, IMP. Okay? So some things, remember, can diffuse in and out just through the plasma membrane. Some require a protein. Water moves in and out with the assistance of a protein. And I'll show you that in a moment. So regular diffusion requires no energy. You understand diffusion. You're good with that, right? And you're good with osmosis. Facilitated diffusion, a little different. It's still diffusion, but we've got the assistance of a membrane protein. And here's a good example of it. Water moves into and out of the cells through via a channel in a particular kind of protein. And the name of that protein is called, and I think it's a brilliant name, it's very descriptive, an aquaporin. Aqua water, well it pours in and it pours out, right? Yeah, water pours in. No? Am I the only one that finds that kind of even a little bit funny? Maybe. We're all writing like that. All right. So you've got these aquaporin proteins, which are simply integral membrane proteins that have a channel going through them, and it allows water to pass through it. Does it allow anything else to move through it? No, because the integral membrane proteins that transport substances are specific for the substance they translocate, right? This only allows water to pass through. And so water only moves through these by diffusion. But it's because water can't move through the phospholipid component, because water's a polar substance. So this channel here allows water to move through, OK? So facilitated diffusion, then, just with the assistance of a protein, is all. Some of these proteins involved with facilitated diffusion don't just have a, a channel which is open all the time. They actually have they, they're what's known as gated proteins. And so in this case, you can see, here's the protein. And do you see the shape the protein is? So here's the substance that that particular protein translocates. does it like this. It binds to a site on the protein. As soon as it does, the protein changes shape like this, and it enables it to go in. So it's almost like a turnstile, right? You go in, it changes shape, lets you go forward. Everybody okay with that, with that Can gated protein? Water? No. Remember, Proteins are specific for the substance they translocate. The aquaporins move water, only water and nothing else. These gated proteins will be specific for the substance they translocate. All right? And there are many substances, and I'll give an example in a moment, but there are many substances that these gated proteins translocate. Each protein type, only one substance. So you've got lots of different kinds of gated proteins. 
and they move large molecules like amino acids. So how many amino, amino acids are important to you? About 20, right? So at least how many gated proteins you're going to have that move amino acids? 20 different kinds, right? And they work like this. The amino acid pops in, binds to that site, causes the proteins to change shape, and it allows it to go through. Don't require energy. So what would happen, remember, this is a protein. The protein is coded for by a gene. There's a gene responsible for producing that protein. What would happen if your gene that made that protein was defective? Gate wouldn't. Gate wouldn't work, right. So what does that mean? You couldn't move the amino acid, at least not as well. Okay. So there is a disease like that. It's called cystinuria. So here's the way cystinuria works. It's an inherited disease. You can inherit a defective gene which produces a defective cysteine transport protein. Cysteine is the name of the amino acid. Okay. All right, so you can inherit the defective gene which means that your cysteine transport protein doesn't work. Doesn't work properly. So you can't move cysteine, at least not very well. And here's what happens in those situations. In your kidneys, the way your kidneys work, in a nutshell, is your kidneys filter out loads of substances from your blood. Just about everything that's in your blood are filtered out in your kidneys. But then your kidneys selectively reuptakes certain substances. Okay? Cysteine is one of the substances that it selectively reuptakes. If that gated transport protein doesn't work, it can't reuptake the cysteine. And then you get cysteine levels build up in your kidneys, and after a while, after it reaches a certain level, the cysteine actually precipitates out and forms little crystals. And they can form kidney stones. Okay? Not just in your kidneys, but in your ureters and your bladder also. Okay? So there's some of the consequences of one of these transport proteins not working. This is a good example. PKU doesn't fall in that. You know, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. It may, but I don't know the mechanism of how PKU works. It may. I'm guessing it probably does, but I don't know. Okay? All right. So, we've talked about passive transport, facilitated diffusion and regular old diffusion. Now we're going to move on and talk about active transport. So here's the crux of active transport. Active transport, as the name implies, requires the input of energy. It's an energy requiring transport process. Active transport requires energy. So, what do you think is the source of energy your body uses to sort of drive active transport? ATP. Yes, ATP. All right. And active transport, if it requires energy, is it moving substances along a concentration gradient or against a concentration gradient? Against. All right, so energy requiring process and it moves substances against their concentration gradient. So it moves substances against the direction they would diffuse. Okay, that's why it requires energy. <coughs> All right, so this diagram is in your book. Um, I don't think there's any need to draw it. You can if you want. I think there is value in drawing these diagrams rather than just looking at them in your book. But I'll explain how it works. So when we talk about active transport, one of the sort of classic examples we talk about is the sodium-potassium pump. It's on page 136. Okay, thank you. Page 136. And these active transport proteins are often called pumps, right? Because they're pumping substances against their concentration gradient. 
So the sodium-potassium pump then. The sodium-potassium pump is a protein that moves sodium one way and potassium another way. And it moves them in opposite directions. All right? So I know I said they're specific for the substances they translocate. In this case, it doesn't translocate a single substance. It's moving both potassium and sodium ions. But it's specific to those. All right? So here's the way it works. Here's our protein, our integral membrane protein. Here's the inside of the cell. And obviously, every, the, this is greatly exaggerated in terms of size, right? And here's the exterior of the cell. So I'll, I'll go through it step by step. All right? Once you get the hang of it, you'll, you'll see it's fairly easy to, to, to get the hang of. So here's the protein, and it adopts a certain shape. And for the sake of this diagram, on this side of the protein, it's sort of circular and nicely fits these sodium ions. In fact, three sodium ions. OK? Then ATP drops off a phosphate, and that energizes the protein. And that causes this protein to change shape. It changes shape. It not only sort of, see the way it's open that side? It closes on this side and opens on that side. But do you see the way these little areas where the so sodium ions bound? Think about squeezing a watermelon pip. They change shape. Boop, they squeeze, and that pips the sodium ions out. Right? So the protein changes shape in two ways. It sort of like goes from this to this. And the areas where those sodium ions were held nice like that, it goes, boop, squeezes them out. OK? Just like, you know, when you get a watermelon pit between your fingers. So it boots the sodium out. OK? Next, what happens is we've got these areas here where potassium ions can bind. And potassium ions outside the cell bind to those areas. They fit nicely. And in fact, our phosphate then leaves, binding of the potassium triggers the phosphate to leave. And as a result, the protein flops back. Its shape changes back okay, to being open to the inside. And the sodium ions are then released, like little watermelon seeds, they're pipped out. And the place where the sodium binds returns to their original shape. And so we can start the process all over again. Sodium binds, drop off an ATP, change the shape, boot sodium out, take potassium in. Okay? So it's a sodium potassium exchange pump. Now, how many sodiums are we kicking out? Three. How many potassiums are we bringing in? Two. All right, so there's a difference there, right? For every three sodiums we boot out, we bring in two potassiums. Okay? So that's going to change our osmotic concentration. All right. If we're bringing in, if we're kicking out three sodiums and bringing in two potassiums, what's going to happen to the concentration of the cytoplasm, the overall concentration of solute? No, it's going to go down, right? Solute concentration inside is going to go down because for it's kicking out three potassiums, bringing in two sodiums. Okay. And so these pumps operate against their concentration gradients. Sodium would naturally want to, and I say want, to diffuse in. Well, we're booting it out, okay? and it takes energy to do that. And potassium, on the other hand, would frequently want to diffuse out when we're bringing it in. Okay? All right. So you see how those pumps work. And you've got pumps that are moving substances all the time against their concentration gradients. I'll see if I can play this movie because it's worth watching. transport, and it requires input of energy from ATP. For instance, 
Most animal cells need to expel sodium ions, Na+, and take in potassium ions, K+, both against their concentration gradients. Here is how the sodium-potassium pump works. Sodium ions bind to a transport protein. ATP transfers a phosphate group to the protein, providing the energy that causes the protein to change shape and push the sodium ions across the membrane, where they are released outside the cell. Potassium ions now bind to the transport protein, and the phosphate group is released. This causes the protein to return to its original shape, releasing the potassium ions inside the cell. The transport protein is now ready to repeat the process. Okay. It's good. Obviously, it goes much faster than that. Okay, so that's active transport then. And you've got lots of different active transport pumps. Hold your horses. All right. So here's a summary of all of the transport processes we just talked about. You've got diffusion across the phospholipid component. You've got facilitated diffusion, which requires the assistance of an integral membrane protein. Both of those are passive, passive processes, don't require energy. And then you've got active transport, which does require energy, moves things against their concentration gradients. Okay? And you can see where some of these are used, for example, in your kidney, to move cysteine back into your blood, transport cysteine, or any other amino acid. So sometimes these active, these pumps, active transport, are used to generate a voltage across a membrane. Okay? So we can get an excess of positive charges, say, outside the cell, in which case we'll have more negative charges inside. That charge imbalance actually creates a voltage, just like the voltage across a battery. And that voltage can be used to do work. Where do you think a voltage generated across a cell membrane functions in your body. Communication, right, nerves, nerve cells. Send a nerve impulse. So you have many hydrogen ion pumps. What would be another name for a hydrogen ion pump? What is a hydrogen ion? Think about what a hydrogen ion is. What is it? Think about the hydrogen atom, and then think about that atom loses an electron, and what's left behind? It's going to be positively charged, but what's left behind? Hydrogen's got an atomic number of one. That should be a giveaway. And it's got an atomic mass of one. So what's left? One proton. one proton. Hydrogen ion is essentially a proton. So hydrogen ion pumps are often called proton pumps. All right, proton pumps. And so that can build up proton gradients on one side of a membrane relative to another. All right, here's a bit. It's sort of lateral, um, yeah, let's say it's lateral thinking, connecting the dots. If a cell was to remove most of its protons, how would that affect the environment outside the cell? Say it removed all of its protons outside the cell. How would that affect the environment outside the cell? I would be positively charged. How else? I didn't want to give you too much. I didn't want to lead you too much. I know I might have to lead you a little more, but I want it to be a little bit painful first. Right? Hydrogen ion concentration. What does that affect? Sorry? 
Yes, the pH. The pH of a solution is a measure of its hydrogen ion concentration. If we're increasing the hydrogen ion concentration outside a cell, what are we doing to the pH outside the cell? We're, increase, we're sorry, increasing the hydrogen ion concentration, but lowering the pH. We're making it more acidic outside the cell. If we're pumping out loads of protons, increasing the hydrogen ion concentration, high ion, hydrogen ion concentrations give you an acidic environment. Plant cells often need to grow or change their shape a little bit. But they've got that rigid cell wall, right? Made of cellulose fibers. They can actually soften the cellulose fibers a little bit by pumping out loads of protons in a certain area, makes it quite acidic in that localized area. And those acidic conditions sort of soften the cell wall a little bit and make it a little bit plastic. So maybe the plant can grow in that area. Okay. In fact, you can take seeds, put them on agar, put a pH indicator, color indicator in the agar, and the roots, the root tips, which are rapidly growing, need to soften their cell walls so they can e expand elongate. And so the plant cells are expelling hydrogen ions all the time. And you can actually see in the agar, the pH color indicator change color to indicate acidic conditions in the vicinity of the plant root. All right. So last things about transport across membranes then. These don't involve diffusion, these next mechanisms I'm going to talk about. They don't involve diffusion. We've got this process of exocytosis. What do you think exo refers to? Exo outside. So exocytosis is the process where cells transport substances from the inside to the outside of the cell via transport vesicles. All right, via transport vesicles. And I'll play this little movie and show you exactly how it works. So a good example is you produce lots of saliva in your salivary glands. Okay? And that saliva contains water. What else does it contain? Amylase and what gives it slimy properties? Glycoproteins. Right? There are a lot of glycoproteins that give it slimy properties. Don't you remember we talked about the tea? Tea containing tannins. Tannin precipitates out the glycoproteins. Makes your mouth dry. So saliva then, your salivary glands make a lot of saliva. Water, amylase, glycoproteins. And to transport those outside the cell, it packages the saliva into vesicles, moves those vesicles to the exterior, to the cell membrane. How does it move them to the, towards the cell membrane? Yeah, what component of it? Microtubules, motor proteins, drag them along the microtubules, right? And then these little vesicles fuse with the cell membrane and release their contents to the outside. It's when the cell needs to move a lot of stuff to the outside. Think about it, you've got small little salivary glands and you're producing a lot of saliva each day. So I'll show you the movie. All right, so then we've got endocytosis. What do you think endo means? Yes. Inside. So this is where the cell moves things from the outside to the inside. And I'm going to mention two kinds of endocytosis. One kind of endocytosis we call pinocytosis. And that's where the cell brings in molecule-sized substances from the outside. Okay. 
molecule size substances, like proteins. And then we've got, and I'll talk about these more in a moment. I'm just going to give you the heads up. Then we've got phagocytosis, which is where the cell brings in larger particles, like viruses or bacteria, but larger substances from the outside inside. And just as exocytosis relies on vesicles being moved to the outside, fusing with the membrane, with endocytosis, the cell is forming vesicles. All right. And I'll show you some movies how that works. So first we've got pinocytosis, which is literally means cell drinking. In pinocytosis, or cell drinking, the cell engulfs extracellular fluid, including molecules such as sugars and proteins. These materials enter the cell inside a vesicle. Epithelial cells and capillaries use pinocytosis to engulf the liquid portion of blood at the capillary surface. The resulting vesicles travel across the capillary cells and release their contents to surrounding tissues, while blood cells remain in the blood. Okay, so we'll look at how that process works. <coughs> See the way the cell membrane invaginates, or like folds in? And they can bring in a very large volume of substances very quickly, the cells in that way. But it's fairly non-specific. They're not specific for certain molecules. They're just kind of bringing in whatever's out there. There might be some specificity, but not much. Okay? So that's pinocytosis. Now let me show you the movie for phagocytosis. In endocytosis... Oh, sorry? No, this is a completely different scale. When we talked about transport across the membrane using the proteins, to give you an idea of the scale, this yellow line represents the membrane. So you'd have these teeny little, little bitty proteins like there and the phospholipid. These are much, much bigger scale-wise. Right. I guess the analogy is you've got you know, a keyhole in a door versus the whole door opening. You can get some things in and out the keyhole, but the whole door opening is what we're talking about this guy. Right, but you know, if, if you've got a cell, and again, I'll draw it on a scale like that, you know, these vesicles are maybe that big. Right? Sometimes they're bigger. In the case of white blood cells, they might be quite large like that. Okay. So look at this phagocytosis then. In endocytosis, membranes invaginate or pinch in to form a vesicle, moving the enclosed materials inside the cell. This process can take different forms, each involving its own specific cell machinery. In phagocytosis, or cell eating, the cell engulfs debris, bacteria, or other sizable objects. Phagocytosis occurs in specialized cells called phagocytes which include macrophages, neutrophils, and other white blood cells. Invagination produces a vacuole, which usually fuses with one or more lysosomes containing hydrolytic enzymes. Materials in the vacuole are broken down by these enzymes and degraded. All right, so let's sort of walk through that again. All right, so here you've got a cell undergoing phagocytosis. And let's just say that large particle it's ingesting is maybe a piece of cellular debris. Or maybe it's a viral particle. Or maybe a, a foreign bacterial cell. But it's a large particle that your body doesn't want. Okay? So your white blood cells have the job of mopping up all of those things. And so there's recognition on the cell surface that that particle needs to be gotten rid of. And so then that triggers this event where, see the membrane starts to form this what's called a pseudopodium. All right? These extensions sort of around that particle it doesn't want, eventually engulfing it, and then forming this vacuole. Okay? 
And then the substance inside that vacuole, in order to completely break it down into its chemical components, it will move it into the cell, and then lysosomes will fuse with it, flood the interior of that vacuole with their hydrolytic enzymes, which will then break it down. Okay? Completely break it down. All right? So you see how everything's sort of coming together, different parts, yeah, that we talked about. What happens when it breaks down? It break down? Breaks it down into molecules, into the monomers that the polymers are made of. They can then get reabsorbed back into the cell, used for things inside that cell, or released to the exterior and used for something else. Yeah. In endocytosis, membranes invaginate or pinch in to form a vesicle, moving the enclosed materials inside the cell. This process can take different forms, each involving its own specific cell machinery. In phagocytosis, or cell eating, the cell engulfs debris, bacteria, or other sizable objects. Phagocytosis occurs in specialized cells called phagocytes, which include macrophages, neutrophils, and other white blood cells. Invagination produces a vacuole, which usually fuses with one or more lysosomes containing hydrolytic enzymes. Materials in the vacuole are broken down by these enzymes and degraded. Okay. What did you say for the pseudopodium? The graphic is on page 139, and all the vocabulary words you just used are pretty clear. Figure 720. If I've got my amoeba movie, I'll sh no, I don't have it on this one. But do you remember when I showed the amoeba movie? The amoeba makes these extensions. They're called pseudopodia. Okay. All right. So we've talked about pinocytosis. We just talked about phagocytosis. We talked about pinocytosis. And that's all, folks, on cell membranes. Okay? <laughs> Who would have thought? Okay? Yeah. <coughs> would you have thought it, Angelica? Uh -uh. You never would have, would you? Never would have. Had you not sat through this 181 class. Amazing. Sorry? All right, any questions then on transport across cell membranes before we leave that topic and move on to the next one? Yep. Well, viral particles, um, your white blood cells are one part of your immune system which would sort of fight against viral particles. All right? In your case, the beta cells are in the pancreas. They're not part of the immune system, but the beta cells are pancreatic cells that are producing insulin. Okay? And so you know, they're producing it by some of the processes we talked about, and they're releasing it by some of the processes we've talked about. But the virus attacked those cells and essentially killed off those cells. So now there are either none left or very few of them left, but they're not making enough insulin. Okay? So the cells that they killed, you know, presumably the virus has been taken care of now, but those cells would have died and your white blood cells might have mopped them up yeah, to, to, re, to um, remove the debris of those dead cells. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Okay, any more questions on membranes, transport across membranes? No? All right, so now we're going to move on then to enzymes and metabolism. All right, we're going to talk specifically about enzymes. So what do we got? What do we got up there? Birds. What kind of birds? What kind of birds? What's this one? It is a kind of vulture. Anybody know what kind of vulture it is? 
No, it was California condor. It's California condor, all right? At one point, there were just a handful of these, a couple of birds left on the planet, okay? And they brought them in captivity, the ones that were left out there, did captive breeding, and raised little chicks, and then released them, and it's been quite a successful release program. But the question is, why were there only a few of these left on the planet? Why did numbers dwindle so much? And then what's this bird here? What kind of falcon? It is peregrine falcon, all right? And that's a peregrine falcon. Now, what's the fastest land animal on the planet? Cheetah, right? Cheetah will get up to 70 miles an hour, and they'll do it in about three and a half seconds. Okay, pretty fast. Even a Lambo or Ferrari, they're usually looking behind their shoulder at a Lambo or Ferrari chasing them, right? This is the fastest animal on the planet, though. All right? It used, the, the story used to go, it can reach speeds of 100 miles an hour in a downward dive. National Geographic recently did some work on these, where they had cameras on them and more sophisticated equipment, and they clocked over 200 miles an hour. I mean, 230 miles an hour was maybe the top speed they reached. Unbelievable. And then, at that kind of dive, they're hitting another bird. That they've got the control to do that. An amazing animal, but these almost made the endangered species list as well. Their numbers were healthy, quite high, and then they dropped. They dwindled significantly, plummeted. And initially, people didn't know why. They didn't really know why the condor numbers dropped so significantly, and they didn't know why these peregrine falcon numbers dropped so significantly. Okay? They investigated the topic, and then they figured out why. Now, I'm not going to tell you the punchline why now, but as we talk about enzymes, and as we understand how enzymes work and what enzymes do, in order to figure out, to solve this mystery, we had to understand how enzymes work. All right? So at the end of this section, you can probably answer the question yourself. Okay? But so, at the end, I'll tell you. I'll bring up this picture again, and I'll tell you why the numbers decline so significantly. But it had to do with their enzymes. Okay? Specifically, the enzymes involved in making their eggshells. All right? Won't say anything more about that. Oh. Oh, let me get rid of that. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. All right. So, enzymes then. Talk about enzymes. Enzymes and metabolism. So, metabolism... Life is organized into these metabolic pathways. So you can break down the chemical reactions in your cells, and you can break them down into specific metabolic pathways that are, of course, interrelated, but you can isolate them. So what do I mean by metabolic pathway? Metabolism, think of the word metabolism as the totality of all of the chemical reactions that go on in your cells. Metabolism is sort of the totality of all the chemical reactions that go on in your cells. And we can break down those chemical reactions into pathways. We can organize them into pathways where, for example, substance A gets converted to substance B, which then gets converted to C, and then gets converted to D. All right, so we've got these pathways, these metabolic pathways, these chemical reactions which are sort of related, and so we call them metabolic pathways. All right? Okay? So we've got these metabolic pathways. And they can be very, very complicated, very complex. So let's take a metabolic pathway, say the one that I've drawn, drawn up there. A gets converted to B, B to C, C to D. There is an enzyme that mediates or facilitates the conversion of A to B. And I would just call it enzyme 1. And then you've got a different enzyme that facilitates the conversion of B to C. 
And then you've got a different enzyme still that coordinates or mediates the conversion of C to D. So your metabolic pathways are all regulated by enzymes. Okay. So look at this. This is a quite complicated metabolic pathway. Each of these dots is a substance, and the line connecting the dot shows that, well, for example, that substance gets converted into that one. And there's an enzyme that does the conversion of this one into this one. So let's take this little part here, one, two, three substances, and we'll sort of blow it up and add the chemistry to it. Well, this little dot here is glucose. Glucose gets converted into, I think this is glucose 1-phosphate there, and that then gets converted into, oh look, that's a 5-carbon, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, oh no, it gets converted into something different, I don't know, I think it's maybe fructose 1-phosphate or something like that. I can't remember what these intermediates are. But you've got a conversion, that's converted to this, this to this, and there's an enzyme that does this conversion from this to this. There's another enzyme that does that, the conversion of this to this. And that just shows you this tiny little step here. Let's, once we add everything else in, it gets very complicated, doesn't it? And this is just the pathway for the breakdown of glucose to produce ATP, to extract the energy in glucose and produce ATP molecules. It's complicated, isn't it? Remember that equation I showed you? Glucose plus oxygen converts to carbon dioxide and water. That's the summary equation for all of this. These are all the steps that really make up that summary equation. And every step is mediated by an enzyme in these pathways. Okay? Not all different enzymes. Some are the same enzymes. Yes, no, absolutely they're different every enzymes. Every one of those dots yes. is a different enzyme. Every dot is a, is a substrate or a product. The line connecting them there's an enzyme that does that conversion. So every line connecting is a different enzyme. Yes. So there's not two amylase in there. There's not two lipase in there. Well, amylase isn't in here. But no, there are no, none of the. No, there's an enzyme there that does it. There's a en different enzyme there, a different enzyme there. Now, if it's the same substrate getting converted to the same product, it's the same enzyme. OK? Loads of enzymes, right? Yeah. OK, so we can sort of break down your metabolism into two parts, two classes, two kinds. We've got catabolic pathways, which form your catabolism. So these catabolic pathways, what do they do? What kind of pathways are they? They're breakdown pathways, right? Catabolic pathways tend to sort of break stuff down. And so on the flip side of the catabolic, what do you got? Anabolic pathways, which build stuff up. Right. And there's the graphic for the anabolic one, right? See, now you never forget anabolic. It doesn't look like this anymore, but... <laughs> Obviously, yes, governor. All right. And look at this one. Here's your, here's your breakdown, your catabolic pathways. Now, when you're studying this, just recall those graphics, and you'll never forget which one is anabolic and which one is catabolic, right? Catabolic is breakdown. Look at those gnarly teeth. They're real teeth. Can you believe it? Okay. So, I want to start off by talking about spontaneous chemical reactions. So, a spontaneous chemical reaction is a chemical reaction that occurs without the net, underlying net, input of energy. It's a reaction that will occur without the net input 
of energy. Now, in some ways, this term spontaneous is a little misleading because you might think spontaneous, that you, you might say well, it occurs immediately, right away. Spontaneous chemical reactions don't necessarily occur immediately and right away, but they're ones that don't require the net input of energy. So here's an example of a spontaneous reaction. A hot object always does what? Without the input of energy, a hot object does what? Cools down. Cools down. Right, it does. It doesn't cool down instantaneously or immediately, does it? No, but it cools down. Gases always do what? expand in their available space. They'll always expand into their available space. That does happen quite quickly. And objects always roll downhill. Ever seen a ball roll uphill? No, it didn't happen. In South Dakota. In South Dakota. Oh, is it one of those illusions? I just got back from there. South Dakota. Oh, is that why you missed Did last? You go to the little house, gravity and up <laughs> it's a tourist trap. <laughs> it's a tourist trap. All right, I've got a little movie to show you a good example of a spontaneous reaction. All right. And people that stand on bridges that jump off always go in what direction? Down. Is that you? That's my twin brother. <laughs> Whatever. of time, I mean, you know, quite a long time. So that's an example of a spontaneous reaction, right? You fall down. But what made me come up? Core. Core. Energy stored in the bungee cord, right? As you reach the bottom. So honestly, it wasn't that frightening. It really wasn't. Um, and it wasn't as much as, a, as an adrenaline rush as I'd hoped it would be. It was thrilling. And you didn't get a jolt when you reached the bottom. In fact, you didn't even know you came to the bottom. You only realized you were going the other direction when the wind like, whistled past in the opposite direction. It was very sort of gentle. Very gentle. So, all right, let's wrap it up then.